hello, hello. Let's get this party started. How is everyone today? Yay! All right. Welcome. My name is Lori Mertes. You are at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. It is the only museum in the world solely dedicated to celebrating women in the arts. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. A few years ago, I was invited by our director, Susan Fisher Sterling, to be the architect of a new public program initiative that she envisioned would place the museum at the intersection of conversations on women and the arts as catalysts for social change. I was honored to have the opportunity to focus on building something new and different within the walls of an art museum that could not be more relevant to the times we're living in. We launched Fresh Talk, the signature program of women, arts, and social change in the fall of 2015 with the mission to convene creative change agents to discuss ideas and address issues that impact particularly women and girls. In addition to our conversations here in this room, Fresh Talk will always include an opportunity for you, the audience, to become a part of the conversation, whether through Sunday supper, a communal meal served family style. How many of you have been to Sunday supper? Got a few people in the room. Say it loud, just say yes. yes. Good. That's me, by the way. I'm not doing very well on my PowerPoint pushing forward of the buttons. Um, in addition to Sunday supper, which happened on Sundays, we also on Wednesdays when we do Fresh Talk, we do something called Catalyst, which is a cocktail hour with a topic and a twist. It's there that we get your participation and feedback. And it helps us to explore and refine what it means to be a 21st century museum that is cause-driven and gender-specific. I'm going to tell you a little bit more, but right now I want to do a little bit of our logistics. Um, I want to thank our donors who have made this initiative that I had the honor of being the architect of possible. And we do have one of our Women, Arts, and Social Change funders here with us tonight who I'm going to embarrass. His name is Dan Logan, and thank you, Dan Logan. We also have an amazing staff who makes this program. I want her in the light. <laughs> this is Alicia Gregory. Alicia Gregory is our new public programs coordinator, and she has pretty much put tonight's program from the coordination end of things all together, all by herself. <laughs> I've been away. Thank you. Alicia comes to us from Americans for the Arts and also from Split This Rock, and I could not be more thrilled to have her on my team. So women, arts, and social change, again, as we approach our 30th anniversary next year, it's programs like these that we really want to see continue. We are gender specific and we are cause driven. We hope that you might consider becoming a member in our 30th anniversary year to help us continue to develop programs like this and really dynamic exhibitions that really demonstrate the museum's commitment to become a champion of women through the arts. Today's Fresh Talk is going to focus on how the arts have the power to move, inspire, and advocate for environmental advocacy. Artists have always been first responders, bringing to light issues and helping us to see and think differently about how we might approach things from creative perspectives. It is only with the rise of global communication and the internet, though, that we've seen some of these ideas truly be disseminated in ways that we've never seen before. For example, when I started out as a curator in Miami in the early 90s, my very first exhibition that I worked on was called Fragile Ecologies, Contemporary Artists and Solutions. The second show I worked on was titled Refuse, but the F was marked out, and to, so that it was called reuse, and it looked at how design and architecture could implement sustainable practices and repurpose materials from the waste system. In those shows, there were artists like Mel Chin. Mel Chin has a show that's closing today at the Corcoran. 
But for years, he has been working on lead poisoning awareness and soil remediation. You'll hear more about Mel from Amy. But those artists that were working through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, very few of us, unless we were somehow connected to their work, did we know about them. I'm hoping today's conversation is going to help us change that. I also grew up in South Florida, where the voices of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and her River of Grass spoke about the beauty and fragility of the Everglades, where Rachel Carson's Silent Spring could not have been more deafening as a result of the spraying of DDT. I truly believe artists can move and inspire us, taking scientific data, empirical experiences, and weaving into alchemy that pulls our emotions and our connectedness and reminds us of our humanity. I'm looking forward to exploring this topic more fully with you all here today. I'm honored that we have with us today women who are active advocates for climate and environmental justice, representing a broad range of platforms through which they do their good work. We have Amy Lipton, who for more than 20 years has empowered conversations in environmental awareness through ecological artworks at Eco Art Space. We have Miranda Massey, who is taking on a very bold, bold vision, bravely looking to establish a new museum in New York City dedicated to climate change. As an activist and an advocate, Jackie Patterson, director of the NAACP's Environmental Climate Justice Program, broadens awareness and empowers communities to be a voice and agents of change. Laura Turner Seidel works at Captain Planet Foundation to educate youth on climate citizenship and also supports environmental stewardship through grant making programs. She's also founded important initiatives from Atlanta Recycles, fostering a culture of sustainable practices through resource conservation, recovery, and recycling, and also Mothers for, and Others for Clean Air. Our moderator, Carrie Fulton, hi Carrie, <laughs> I hadn't seen you earlier today, is in, <laughs> she's got a bio that's really long as well. We have amazing <laughs> speakers. <laughs> we have a, Carrie Fulton is involved in a number of local, global, and international coalitions, including PowerShift, the largest youth climate summit in the US. And she also is serving as the director of the Environmental Justice Climate Change Initiative. Their full bios, which truly are only the tip of the iceberg, um, are in your brochures. And yes, I did say tip of the iceberg. <laughs> tip of the iceberg. Today's Fresh Talk is all about a convening of champions, and no cause today could be more universally urgent. The subject of environmental justice is not specific to identifying as red or blue, left or right. It is a nonpartisan, essential issue for humanity. We know that each of you has an impact in your actions. Like the wings of a butterfly on water, they have a ripple effect. We have an activity today at Sunday Supper that Alicia has put together where we're going to be asking you to tell us about your letter to the future and the things that you're going to do after tonight to help be agents of change. Before we move to our conversation, we have a very special video message from Mary Robinson. I want to thank Ken Dutter, who is on our National Advisory Board for the museum, for making this connection possible. Mary Robinson is the first woman president of Ireland. She's the former United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, and she is president of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. And I don't think she could say it better, so I'll turn it over to Mary. I'm delighted that the National Museum of Women in the Arts has opened a conversation about how the arts can inspire environmental advocacy. This is very important for climate justice which focuses on the injustice of climate change, the fact that its impacts and effects are felt much more in vulnerable communities and vulnerable countries who have been least responsible for the problem of global warming, the problem of climate change. I came to climate change not as a scientist or an environmental lawyer. I came to it through my work on human rights in African countries. And everywhere I went in Africa, people kept saying things are so much worse and it was about the unpredictable weather, the not only unpredictable, but the disruptive 
worse storms, worse drought, long periods of drought and then flash flooding, the fact that villages were destroyed, that food security was undermined, and of course it had a huge impact on women and children. There's a very big gender dimension to climate change. It is very clear that women in their traditional roles have to try to put food on the table, have to go further to find the water, have to go further uh, to uh, get the food, and have to change the uh, maize because it's not a good um, crop into growing vegetables, for example. And I see this all over African countries and elsewhere. The arts can be very effective in communicating climate justice. In March this year, I was at a film event in Copenhagen and I watched a documentary called Thank You for the Rain. It was made by a farmer in Kenya because he was told and taught how to use a video. And he was very sensitive to his wife and children and their story and the way that they were even more affected than he was. And he was also trying to train other farmers. And he went to a climate conference to try to get his message across. More recently, I had an unexpected email from Jane Hirschfield, a well-known poet in the United States who's also a friend. Um, she sent me the poem that she had specially written for the forthcoming March for Climate, um, in, uh, March for Science um, in Washington DC on the 22nd of April. I had also intended to March for Science in Dublin on that day, and I was invited to read her poem which I would like to read to you now. On the fifth day, by Jane Hirschfield. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air, and the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced, and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts the facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers, and only the wind that spoke of its bees, while the unpausing factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move towards their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers of boulders and air. Bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stockers, code writers, machinists, accountants, lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. I believe that that poem is the most effective way that I could think of to communicate the importance of climate justice. Thank you. Hi everyone, how's everybody doing? Still good? Good. I love that poem as an introduction to this panel, which I see as being all about breaking the climate silence and breaking the silence that surrounds other critical issues of environmental justice and environmental harm. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, in the back, you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, great. My name is Miranda Massey, and I'm the director of the initiative to create a museum dedicated to climate. Um, and to be here at a cause-driven, groundbreaking museum, and speaking at a program that's specifically dedicated to generating engagement and dialogue on solutions to move us forward, um, gives us very much a sense of kinship on the climate museum team, because that's what we aspire to do as well. And to be speaking in this incredible company of, of fellow panelists is a huge honor. So Lori, thank you, and Alicia, thank you. We're delighted to be here. Our mission um, is to create, um, is to employ, excuse me, the sciences, art, and design to inspire dialogue and innovation that address the challenges of climate change in order to move solutions to the center of our shared public life and to catalyze broad community engagement. So there are really two takeaways from that. The first is that the overall goal is, of course, as with any museum, learning. And there are intellectual goals that we have. But more importantly than that, we have a goal to build dialogue and engagement and action. 
That's our overarching mission. And our programmatic priorities, consistent with that goal, are to be interdisciplinary, using the sciences, art, and design, um, and to focus on building the broadest possible and most diverse possible climate public, so to be very broadly participatory, and also to focus on solutions. We have to tell the truth about the environmental and climate crises that we face, but we have to focus on solutions in order to move forward. Why are museums any good at doing this? What is, why a museum? Why a climate museum? Museums are incredibly powerful instruments for change. Um, first of all, they're incredibly popular. There are 850 million museum visits a year in the US. So that's way more than major league sports combined. Um, beyond that basic popularity, the research shows changes not only, again, in intellectual outcomes, learning, curiosity, critical thinking, all of which are obviously key, and I don't mean to minimize them, but also the, step, the next step of dialogue and engagement and action. There's a lot of research out there showing that museums can shift behavior and make it more pro-social, and that's really what we're after. Museums are especially powerful instruments for change when they call for action, and that might seem counterintuitive. You might think that a museum, which is so effective at having all of these fantastic outcomes, in part because it's so trusted as a social institution, could undermine that trust and thus undermine its effectiveness by calling directly for action. But there's new data, you see it there on the left, that shows that in fact the opposite is true. When museums build on the social trust that they have as civic institutions by calling for action that's consistent with their missions, they actually enhance that public trust, which is quite an extraordinarily, extraordinary tool to have in your toolkit if you're creating a museum like the one we're trying to create or developing the programming for a museum like this one. Um, and because, as this research comes out, there's a developing understanding among thought leaders that the strengths of museums could be mobilized specifically around the questions of the climate crisis and of climate justice to move toward the development of a broader climate public that can both support and demand climate action from private sector and public sector decision makers. Uh, so you see that on the, the right of the screen. As some of, some of you all have occasion to know, and some of you probably don't, Nature Climate Change is one of the most respected peer-reviewed journals in the field. It's a, an offspring of the journal Nature, and when they created um, a series of more specific journals, they decided to do away with punctuation in between. I don't know why there isn't a colon there, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's, the, that, the, that's the, the, the title of one of the, the top regarded um, uh, journals on climate change, both in terms of climate, climate communications, but also more broadly the science. Some examples. So, so all, of these, all of these factors add up to make museums um, a really powerful place for convening discussion and for supporting action on climate, um, which I'm quite confident everybody in this room agrees we need in order to move forward. And that's probably never been clearer um, now in the United States than in the last few months. Um, so can I see some nods and some, yes, we agree. <laughs> some of our favorite museums that help, um, help us develop our own proof of concept as we're in a very early development, developmental stage for why museums can be so powerful as instruments of change. Um, we have three examples here today. I'll start with this from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and what a great example of the special kind of learning that museums provide. It's social, it's physical, and it's emotional. Look at everybody crowded in, um, totally disregarding the usual norms of personal space that we have in the United States to get closer to this incredible spectacle of the live ocean. That's actually the ocean for, for people who haven't had a chance to, to visit or don't remember, that's the ocean. It's a t it's the, the aquarium is built in a tidal pool and that is the ocean, not just an aquarium. Um, and people just can't get enough of it. They're inspired by awe. 
And the Monterey Bay Aquarium is actually in a certain way one of our closest precedents, though it's an aquarium, not a museum, because it's really an ocean conservation project disguised as an aquarium. <laughs> and that's what we want to do for climate. Shifting tones emotionally in a way that I hope won't seem too abrupt, um, this is the 9-11 Museum shortly after it opened. And that column that you see was one of the support columns. The markings that you see on it are um, uh, very profoundly, uh, movingly, missing persons photos. And then also the notations of the emergency and then construction workers, the functional notations in spray paint uh, for where this column belonged and what had to be done with it next. Um, and one of the things that I love about this photograph is it shows how museums create conversation and interaction. So you have at least two different active conversations happening there. You have several different ways of interacting with the meaning of this profound exhibit. And um, most of all, in some ways, for climate, we don't have time today to talk about all the different barriers to the, to the development of a broad climate public. Um, but museums are very well suited to breaking down those barriers. One of those barriers is that climate can seem very abstract and distant and contradictory. Why, are there, why is there 20 feet of snow in Boston when highways are catching fire in California, and how does that relate? We might understand it intellectually, but it's hard to feel. And um, objects like this can take the unimaginable and the vast and make it palpable and personal and tangible. Um, and we'll show you an object like that for climate in a moment. Um, but that happens through a social process. And that's, that's one of the many strengths of museums. And then finally, speaking of social process, those from DC and, and some others will recognize this as the fantastic new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, um, which was met rightly with just enormous delight and celebration. And this museum and this photograph have something to say to us about, about how, um, sorry to drift the microphone, you guys still hear me? Yeah. yeah? Um, uh, about how museums both express and confer social priority. So by creating large, beautiful spaces dedicated to a subject, what we're saying is that it matters. So by going into a museum of women in the arts, just by stepping in the doorway, you're making that subject matter a little bit more in the world and in your own heart. And that's something that museums have the capacity to do as trusted and inspiring civic institutions. Um, they're where we go to share the stories we need to share. Um, and, and that's reflected both in this museum and we aspire to express that also in the Climate Museum. Museums are places where we deal together with subjects of importance. They're places we come together to think about things that matter and to feel together about things that matter. So why art in a climate museum? This might feel a little redundant for this audience, uh, given that you're all here to, to hear a panel about exactly this, but we still think it's important to, to talk a little bit about art and climate justice and climate education. For a long time, climate scientists worked on a deficit, um, information deficit model of climate education. Raise your hand if you've heard that phrase before or know what it means. So just a few people, basic idea, we suffer, we, uh, we, we suffer from a distressing level of inaction on climate and on addressing climate change because people don't have the information that they need. That's obviously partly true. But the truth is that people have gone about saying that information in scientific terms repeatedly for a very long time, and we still haven't gotten the climate, the level of commitment to climate action that we need. Um, and that's because the the information deficit model of climate communication, it's been now shown very, very um, effectively by different studies, doesn't deal with the fact that we human beings are, prim are primarily creatures of emotion. Um, and in order to get our attention on scientific data, you first have to get our emotion. Uh, and so art evokes emotion. Art also engages new audiences 
and it reframes the conversation around hope. Climate can be a very distressing subject, and the inequalities built into the climate crisis as it develops can be profoundly overwhelming emotionally. But climate art can help us move through that to a sense of hope. I'll talk very briefly about four artists and art projects whose work we've been very, very lucky to engage with at the Climate Museum. First, Ice Watch Paris, which was an art installation carried out on the occasion of the UN's climate conference in December 2015 um, by the, the wonderful Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson. That's glacial ice that's 15,000 years old that's calved off a glacier. Uh, this is the reference I made to the column from the 9-11 Museum. It helps make glacial loss immediate and felt and intimate. And because it's so beautiful and because people wanted to touch it so much, rather than being terrifying, it offered a gentler and more tender pathway into engaging with um, sea level rise and glacial loss. The People's Climate March in 2014, over there on the right, was in part, was magical for many, many reasons. One of the reasons it was so magical was because of the presence of art. You see there the, the first contingent in the march, which was youth of color from Brooklyn in the organization Uprose, which is one of the foremost climate justice organizations in the US, been doing work really effectively for decades. And those sunflowers with all their symbolic resonance became a kind of icon of the march. Uh, another example of the power of climate art. Storytelling with Sari's Mo Monica, I don't know if, if, uh, if you're here, but Monica Jahan Bose, hi Monica, who marched with us in the, um, in the Climate March here in DC a couple of weeks ago as part of the Climate Museum contingent, has a wonderful project using Sari's and writing Bengali on Sari's to tell a multitude of different stories about women and in particular about women, women in climate. And then finally, a wonderful dancer, Jody Sperling, whose work addresses a number of climate-related issues in different venues. Um, I will, despite my efforts to practice and time, I've now run out of time. Um, so maybe in the Q&A or afterwards at the, at the dinner, um, I'd be delighted to answer specific questions that people have about the Climate Museum. But I do want to end um, by saying that the basic point of using art and what art does to us as, as organisms with feelings um, is it helps us know that if we come together, we can talk about the most difficult things and solve them. And that's what the Climate Museum wants to be about. It's what this event is about. And it's what your presence here tonight is about. So thank you for that presence. And thank you all. Oh, the, and we, we'll have downstairs. Thank you, Laurie. We'll have downstairs sign-up sheets for our um, newsletters. You can also go to our website, which is climatemuseum.org, um, and we have stickers. We have minor swag downstairs as well. So <laughs> please pick up a sticker, sign up, and wonderful to meet you all. Good afternoon. It's great to be here with, with all of you in this amazing museum. I uh, was just so honored to have been asked to come and speak to you today about how the arts can inspire environmental advocacy. And if you ask the question, I say, by all means, and the five people that I'm going to cover now and their relationship to the arts is proof positive uh, that, that there is a huge impact and uh, we all can be part of the solution. So uh, my presentation really is about plastic pollution. Uh, it's an enormous problem. It's very obvious. Um, we all uh, can recycle and reduce our consumption. That's the one simple and easy thing that we can do. And if we're not doing it, then it's really hard to get some of the, to some of the bigger issues. 
Um, obviously, you know, this children is child is in a sea of plastic, and that is what's going on around the world. Every minute, there are two million tons of plastic that ends up in our oceans. And obviously, if you're an animal person like I am, uh, we are losing a million seabirds a year and a hundred thousand mammals. Um, and I don't know if how what the ages of our audience is, but do you remember the Keep America Beautiful video with the Native American that was very upset by um, what he was witnessing? He was canoeing. It could have been the Hudson River. It uh, could have been right out here in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but there was a tear coming down his face, and that pulled at my heartstrings, and that really set me off on, on this uh, plastic awareness journey. And we used to, as a family, pick up plastic bottles and cans in our neighborhood, and I've been to many beaches, as remote as can be, the Arctic uh, included, and there's plastic pollution in the most remote places where it shouldn't be. And in developing countries, it is just, I just got back from Cam Cambodia, and it is so upsetting because you're in the middle of these plastic gyras, uh, all of this uh, pollution everywhere, and you really can't do much about it. But the people I'm gonna feature um, can. And I'm gonna uh, show you this video because it says a lot. Open your eyes. When did we become a plastic society? We got plastic bags, plastic water bottles, plastic straws, plastic cups, plastic wrap, plastic utensils, and plastic to-go containers. Plastic is a substance the Earth cannot digest. And every bit of plastic that has ever been created still exists. Every day in the United States, we throw out almost 88,000 tons of plastic. Now, what happens to plastic after you use it? Well, most of it goes into landfills. A portion gets into the water course and eventually ends up in the oceans. Recycling is not a sustainable solution. It's actually called downcycling because plastic never goes away. Consumption of disposable plastics has spiraled out of control. What is the number one thing plastic is made out of? Well, every year, we use 17 million barrels of oil to make plastic water bottles. This is enough to fuel one million cars every year. Plastic pieces on the ocean's surface now outnumber sea life six to one. Plastic makes up almost 90% of all trash floating on the ocean surface, 46,000 pieces of plastic per square mile. What effect does plastic have on human health? Plastic chemicals like BPA are absorbed by the body. Studies show that they alter hormones and disrupt the endocrine system. By refusing disposable plastic, you can improve the health of the ocean and the environment around us, including human health and animal health. Since 2009, Plastic Pollution Coalition has been building a global alliance to combat single-use disposable plastic. Our membership includes individuals, organizations, NGOs, businesses, campuses, and policymakers. We share resources, tools, and messaging with our coalition to develop a broad-based strategy to tackle the issue head on. We're working with universities, businesses, festivals, musicians, and more to create replicable and sustainable approaches to eliminating single-use disposable plastic. So this, obviously, that was Jeff Bridges, and he's using his celebrity platform to educate the, the world about the problems of plastic pollution. And this is Deanna Cohen that's co-founded the Plastic Pollution Coalition, and you should check out her TED Talk and follow them on social media because they are so powerful and great um, about it. But uh, 20 years ago, she... Uh, started making her art out of plastic bags to tell the story of plastic pollution and the 
plastic started breaking down after a couple of years in her artwork. And she started making the connection that, you know, maybe that was a cool thing because we all age, we start to break down and it tells like a natural tale. But then she learned about the five gyras, uh, these garbage patches in the, in the oceans. And it kind of demonstrated that the plastic was breaking down like that in these gyras. And it's something that does not go away. Every bit of plastic that was ever produced is still with us and it's just in smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and she was the first one that educated me. It's not just about the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but it's about refusing. That's the fourth R, and we need to be doing that as, as uh, much as possible. And because of the work of the coalition, they were actually able to ban plastic bags in uh, California, which is the first state uh, to do it, and Hawaii was the second state. And then Diana introduced me to this woman, Pam Longabardi, who's a distinguished professor of art at Georgia State University, right in my backyard. I'd never met her or heard of her. But in 2006, she went to uh, the Hawaiian Islands to uh, photograph beautiful beaches and sunsets. And when she got there, she found a big surprise. And there were just mountains of plastic pollution everywhere. So she decided that she was going to start doing her art out of uh, the found bits of plastic uh, that she picked up on these beaches. So she catalogs the plastic and then she collects it and puts it in her art. And when she goes to these places, she also engages with the community and educates them, gives them um, a beach cleanup projects to do. Uh, her art is amazing. And she has uh, traveled and exhibited all over the world her collection uh, in galleries and museums. Um, she's uh, very, very well known in, in that world, and uh, she really um, is doing a great job in her most current uh, exhibition, uh, well, the one that she's getting ready to exhibit, tells a story about um, the Syrian migration. Um, 500,000 migrants got into little rafts with life preservers and went to Lesbos uh, off the coast of Greece and have just dumped their life preservers. So it's a human tale, 500,000 of these life preservers and their boats that were mostly made out of plastic that the, that the um, smugglers cut up into pieces so that they couldn't be used again. And what she found out is a lot of those life preservers weren't even life preservers. They looked like it and they were stuffed with fluff, but if somebody needed to depend on that life preserver, they're, they're, they would have perished. Um, so, you know, She's doing a, a, an amazing job telling a great story. And then, of course, we have to feature youth because uh, the children will lead us. And when they talk, everybody's quiet and they pay attention. This is Hannah Testa. She started um, becoming active on animal rights issues. And, um, uh, and, and from there, she watched a very important documentary called Plastic Paradise, which I recommend all of you watch. And so it pulled at her heartstrings so much that she decided to work with her state legislator and create Plastic Pollution Awareness Day at the state capitol in Georgia. And if you know Georgia, that would be a really difficult thing to do, <laughs> um, But uh, which is where we're from. But the great thing, that how she incorporated the arts, as you can see, she had children from her school, you know, do these magnificent messages in, in their own um, art form. And, and they just were so thrilled to have Hannah take it to the state capitol and line the walls, and that their little voices were being heard. And Hannah's uh, work, she's gone pretty much global now. CNN featured her on Earth Day. So I ask you to look up her segment and see uh, all of the great work that she's doing. And uh, she's partnering with uh, Adrian Grenier on his Lonely Whale project and his focus on um, uh, getting rid of straws, plastic straws. My pet peeve. Um, and this is Carter and Olivia Rees. They started an organization called One More Generation, and it was based on their passion for saving endangered species. 
and they realized that they couldn't do a lot of work on rhinos and elephants that were so far away and, and big cats. So they did, they took what they learned and brought it to their community. When the oil spill happened in the Gulf, they actually went there and started helping the animals and washing the oil off of them and really uh, getting into it. Um, and the best way that they could educate uh, youth on on issues related to oil was coming up with this week-long uh, curricula, uh, and they've been working in 50 schools over the past couple of years, and at the, the, the kids during the week save all their plastic that they use in their households, and then they bring it to school, and they design an art installation, and on the last day they put it together. So um, then they take pictures of it, and they use it to inform their parents and their grandparents, and, uh, and really, um, you know, uh, inform their communities. So this is a great thing that they've done. And then they started six months ago this One Less Straw campaign, and they've got the City of Atlanta Public Schools getting rid of plastic straws. Delta Airlines now and their employee cafeteria um, are getting rid of plastic straws, and it could happen as well in their lounges, the Delta lounges, and they've also gone after 200 restaurants and a couple of them restaurant chains to get rid of plastic straws and, and those 200 uh, restaurants have made the commitment to do that and they're saving so much money now that they can buy paper straws and offer those which obviously biodegrade and, uh, and, and they're saving, you know, they're saving the world one straw at a time. And so um, basically, we, you know, there's this amazing global campaign. 800 organizations around the world are, uh, have launched this movement and are coordinating, and it's all about breaking free from plastic. And we obviously can be a part, we have a role to play, so let's do it. Thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I am going to, to demonstrate how, um, thank you, how we, how we and different groups in, and women in the movement have really engaged around women in the arts to tell the story of environmental and climate justice. And so it'll be through visual arts, through spoken word, through video, through f f photography, through dance, and through um, the art of being an auctioneer because I have 40 slides, three videos, and 10 minutes. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So the first one, <laughs> um, the first one will be this video, which will hopefully be two minutes back. Oh yeah, good. All right. Yes, that is true. Hey, <laughs> can see everyone. Um, all right, here we go. So starting with uh, the story of Baytown, Texas. Ebony is the voice that you'll be hearing. The city of Baytown is made of old money, lower to middle class families, and pollution. But if you get a job at a chemical plant, you don't have time to think of a solution. I guess my brother, my uncle, and my cousins are sellouts because they went industrial instead of the drug route. Refinery city lights and pipes run along the Gulf Coast. The smoke boasts with sulfur air. It's a wonder. Anyone's able to take a breath. We're so used to it, we forget. Soon, the sons and daughters won't be able to drink the water. They say the first priority is the people, but the people are the ones being excluded and uprooted. Just ask Archer Courts, ask George Washington Carver Elementary, or ask the Suburbanites, Exxon Sacrifice, AKA Brownwood Neighborhood. God bless social media, but Flint ain't the only case of complexion without protection. Baytown, AKA the Dirty Bay, is surrounded by giant toxins threatening the city in every way. We see the huge steel from our window sills make jokes as we choke. 
We've been possibly dying from this kind of poison oak. It's no mystery that the black and brown communities are being targeted. Black lives matter, but not when they're expendable and making money is good for the market. Give them a fine, it's fine. They can afford it. We live with the headaches, the shortness of breath, and watery eyes. They keep building, and we pay for it. Constantly trying to heal ourselves and repel the environmental destruction. Breathe it in. Then breathe out. Thank you. So that was Ebony, and that's from it's excerpt from this film that's coming out called In the Air that's coming out soon, really with, with similar stories of those differential impacts. And so really she tells the story of the current course that we're on in terms of profits over people, in terms of profits over the planet and its well-being. She talked about the commons and the, the need for the commons that we all have, but that certain communities are being sacrificed for it, to do, whether it's developing energy or otherwise. That through our visual storytelling, through photography, we have the stories of folks like this family out in the Four Corners region out west where the coal fire power plant behind them is one of four coal fire power plants within a 50 mile radius of the Navajo land on which they live. And But they had those two coolers on their porch because they, like 70% of the people in, in, in that land, don't have access to electricity themselves because those four coal fire power plants went to power Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. We have communities like Cesar Chavez High School um, in, in Houston, Texas, where that oil refinery is one of five oil refineries within a 10 mile radius of that school where they have no zoning in Houston because it's a, a pro-business environment where it's again profits over people and their well-being. We, she mentioned the, 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 the Flint water crisis and we know that it was, it's because of a history of under-regulated pollution where the, fl the, the Flint River became so toxic that it wasn't even, it wasn't able to be used for the water supply for that community. And it's the history that we've seen in so many communities of underregulated pollution, disinvestment, and then displaced democracy that puts families in peril. And we all know where some of these, uh, <laughs> what's driving a lot of what's happening. <laughs> so another good graphic art um, that really kind of shows the tentacles of, of, of influence that we see over various systems and what the impact is over our democracy. And, um, we, and we, we see that playing out in things where you can actually have Halliburton actually applying for a loop, for a, um, a exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act. The fact that there's even a form you can fill out <laughs> to ask for an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act lets us know how far away we are from where we need to be in terms of um, corporate control over our democracy. And then we see on the other side, in terms of climate change, um, communities that are already food insecure, where they're more likely to get a Dorito or a Frito or a Cheeto than kale or quinoa or anything of any kind of um, um, health um, giving um, properties. And then we see the other side in terms of the extreme weather events that are affecting communities across the country. Women who, as we were saying before, having to walk further to get water. Women who are experiencing violence because violence against women is a known result of, um, of disaster, post-disaster context. Then we have who's making decisions even after disasters. This is a town hall meeting I was at in Huntsville, Alabama, where on the stage all the people who are making decisions were white and men, and again, um, from local government, from FEMA, from American Red Cross. And while lined up at the mic, everybody who had questions, who had needs, who had services that they had to access were African American women. Then we also make the, the tie with other issues we're dealing with. Now we're dealing with an administration that's looking for more punitive immigration policies as if it's people coming in to get our stuff. When we know that the U.S. is 4% of the global population, but 25% of the emissions that drive climate change, they're driving people out to really seek resources for their families, just livelihood, just being able to survive as families. And this poem, for another art, from this Kenyan-born Somali poet, Warsan Shire, tells a story. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So another, I'm not gonna play this whole video because again, I'm really getting into auction meter mode. But this uh, person <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> this uh, is Destiny Walford who actually- My name is Destiny. Well, yeah. I was mm -hmm. born and raised in Curtis Bay, a tight-knit community in the city of Baltimore. Curtis Bay is my home and it means a lot to me, which is why I want to show you what it's like to live here. Here's my high school. Last year, a group of students and myself created a human rights group called Free Your Voice. 
As a group, we transformed the way that we looked at the world in terms of our basic human rights and what we want for ourselves, our families, and our communities. We have a lot of things that we're proud of in our community. This is our garden. Beautiful, isn't it? The garden provides fresh fruits and veggies for the community because we don't have a local grocery store. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not a fan of bugs. And as you can imagine, the garden is filled with them. But it's worth it because the garden brings the community together. A lot of students from Curtis Bay Elementary School and community members helped to build it. We made the garden from the ground up and we're all really proud of it. It's something we can call our own. Now I want to show you our park. A park can serve as a kind of sanctuary, a safe place where children can have fun and be themselves. It's kind of like living in your own little universe, a place where the ugliness of the world isn't allowed. All communities should have this, but we don't. Come on, there's one last place I want to show you. This is Curtis Bay's backyard. Growing up, I knew the industry was here. I could see it, I could smell it, but I learned to ignore it. For some reason, I never felt welcome. I wonder why. Over time, it was almost as if it wasn't there, but it is. Curtis Bay and communities surrounding it are suffering on a daily basis. The pollution threatens our health and our environment. We know the air we breathe isn't clean. We know this, however, we lack answers to basic questions about how bad it is. What's worse is that we often don't play a meaningful role in the decisions that affect us. I am going to stop it and there just because of the time. the only ones you seem to but, be paying um, but I will tell you that um, that we're in the kind of hope part of the presentation, believe it or not, and that the good news, <laughs> the good news here is that uh, Destiny and her group for your voice actually won this campaign. That they were they made this video to really kind of uh, tell their story of of what they want for their community, which is the same thing we all want in terms of the beloved community. And they fight this fought this battle over this uh, incinerator, one of the largest incinerators in the country that would have been built in their backyard in Curtis Bay on top of the other pollution pollutants that they had there. And they actually won that campaign. So <laughs> congrats to them. And uh, as a result of that, Destiny, I think, was the youngest ever recipient of the Goldman Prize Award um, afterwards. So yeah. <laughs> So as she described the, the beloved community, in the end she talks about human rights and she talks about, she, she, is, she says, I'm human, so-and-so is human, she starts to assert that. And the fact that she even felt like she had to assert the humanity really gives us a sense of how undervalued she and her community felt um, in terms of the, the levels of pollution that they were visited upon them. So we remind ourselves of the human and civil rights to which we should all have a right, but which are differentially applied in different places. So as we advance this notion of, 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 of human rights and, and, and civil rights, we uh, have this frame around resistance, resilience, reclamation, and revolution. And this is a quote from Shana Griffin, who's with the uh, uh, Women's uh, Gender Justice Group in New Orleans. I'm not interested in any action plan to rebuild or organize a people's agenda in New Orleans without a gender analysis and a demand for community accountability. So like Destiny and others, I mean, they're really, the people are taking, taking the lead in terms of pushing for solutions themselves, because we know that it's really community leadership, community voice, community decision making that makes the, the best outcomes for communities. So whether it's pushing forward for, for greater democracy, as she said, she didn't feel a part of decision making, but she was able to really garner this campaign through cultural arts and, and so forth to actually have that win in their community. So we're looking to reclaim a democracy that's been stolen. And so through um, this is uh, some groups that, that came together um, in, um, in the, at the UN climate talks. So the woman on the right is from Gulfport, Mississippi, a survivor of Hurricane Katrina, and other women coming together under this banner of, of gender justice and climate justice and that's two the woman in the middle again from Gulfport the survivor of Katrina flanked by two women who are survivors of super typhoon Haiyan um, from the Philippines and we really see this also in the frame of Black Lives Matter because whether people are being racially profiled and shot down the streets or they're dying a death of a thousand cuts because they're more likely to be exposed to different to pollution or to to perish and, and disasters at, at the UN climate talks in 2015 the the H historically black colleges and university group all came Came together and they did a die-in during um, during the UN climate talks at the UN session at the at the United Nations to really and did the whole 4.5 minute die-in to illustrate the linkages between the movements. And so even as we try to make this transition, we know that we're often going in the path of, of false solutions. This is a quote from Martin Luther King, all progress is precarious, and the solution of one problem brings us face to face with another. And so we know as women that often it's um, it's about, it's about uh, 
what do you call it, population control that people are trying to push forward. So we need to keep going, we want to keep going with business as usual in terms of consumption and consumerism, but we just want to kind of stop black and brown folks basically from having having more babies to kind of take up the resources that, that we all want to cling to as uh, as as the wealthy as the wealthy few. And so these are the kind of challenges that women find themselves encountering. And then other kind of techno fixes. Um, and so this is uh, Sister Sweetwater. I'm um, really calling out some of the techno fixes that people are trying to push forward as well. So as we really start to talk about the solutions in terms of transition, this is a one minute little clip from a group out in Minneapolis who is talking about the transition we need to make in terms of starting to grow our own food. So, you are watching family videos uh, while you right, could so be stay so with group on. Okay, here we go. Putting poison in your brain, be more people at the club, popping bottles of that water, dabbing on that fast food, pulling veggies out the garden. I go hard, I eat good, and I put that on my mama, eating healthy school lunch, and that's where the Miss Obama, drinking water, living longer, no process drama. Call me John Deere, shawty, I be growing like a farmer, dad. Yeah, I'm sorry, I won't play that whole thing. We can listen to that all day, but uh, <laughs> yeah, very impressive. <laughs> So yeah, so that's a great group if you want to look them up, Appetite for Change and their Grow Food um, um, song. So they uh, they are do they're, they're taking back the land and starting to grow their own food through this this initiative. And um, hopefully everyone is kind of well versed enough in rap to be able to understand what she was saying. But uh, you laughed at the appropriate moment, so that was a good sign. So uh, <laughs> so as we so as she, as she was saying, we really do need to make this transition from this extractive economy that's built on exploitation, consumerism, dominance nation and so forth and move, really stop the bad in terms of these polluting practices and move towards the good which is having a living economy that's regenerative that's built based on qualities and 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 and, um, and values of caring and sacredness and ecological and social well-being and so this is all the frame that groups under uh, 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 the climate justice alliance and other groups are, are really uniting around in terms of the transition so moving away from drilling and burning to power our communities to harnessing the sun and the wind moving away from burning or burying waste to actually uh, recovering, using, and recycling waste or, and not generating it in the first place, as we were saying, in, in terms of um, um, re reducing our you know, use of these harmful goods, and so forth and so on. I won't go through all of that because we really want to wrap up. But um, and some of the groups are really coming together now to push f under, these, um, under this transition, power without pollution, energy without injustice, getting women on rooftops and starting to install solar pl panels. We had a woman that we work with, Amy Mays, out in Arizona, who the electricity company turned off her electricity because she couldn't pay bills and then um, then they they imposed hundreds of dollars in a security deposit that she would have had to pay to get her 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 lights back on she decided to just get a cooler get some ice and then just go without electricity she did that for two years while she saved her money and bought solar panel by solar panel got her journeyman's electrician license got up on her roof and installed her own solar panels <laughs> so yeah so that's the kind of movement we want to support as we go forward. So, and, and just ending on a, on a note of humor, which is another art form. I, I'm an avid fan of um, Saturday Night Live, either it's good days and it's bad days. And um, <laughs> they were, um, so in the, in the same vein as um, the African proverb, in term, till lions unite, the, to, in, until lions write their own history, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Um, the uh, Saturday Night Live skit told the story in a humorous way in that they were saying that a hunter that was, that they had thought they had shot this deer and killed the deer, um, that the deer rose up and gored the hunter. And so they kind of gave this visual in terms of the headline in the local newspaper. And then they said, or as told by the deer community, serial killer injured as victim <laughs> fights back. <laughs> so <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> Um, why it's so important for us to tell our own story in the way that we like to tell it. So just wrapping up with our interdependence and our strength lying in each other's strength, the need to really center love. I'm really, um, really talking a lot about leading with love and practicing radical love. And to that end, uh, Martin Luther King's quote, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here.
for this important discussion. Thank you to Lori and Alicia for the organizing, and thank you to my fellow panelists. You're all really hard act to follow, and it's really hard to be last. Um, I'm not a great auctioneer, but I do have way too many slides, so um, I'm going to try to go through them quickly. But um, before I do, I'm Amy Lipton, and I work with Eco Art Space. Uh, founded by Patricia Watts in 97, which I joined her in 99, so it's true for almost 20 years. We have been advocating for environmental issues through the arts, uh, numerous environmental issues, way too many to even list here, but we've uh, worked with artists who deal with not only climate change, water, water pollution, species, habitat decline, pollution, oceans, soil, soil remediation, many, many, many topics. Um, any one of the artists I'm gonna show you today, I could devote my entire talk to, and I, I wish I had the time to do that because there are so many and they're all so great. Um, but before I um, start showing my slides, um, I just, I wanted to talk a little bit about art in general and the question of artists um, addressing environmental issues, which really is a relatively recent phenomena. I mean, 20th century art was about artists working as loners in their studios, you know, desperately, you know, being poor and impoverished and, you know, the whole model, the whole idea of what we have is that artists are struggling, artists are never going to really, you know, make it and get their message out. And the 20th century model <clears throat> of art really sort of encouraged this very insular view of art and the artist's life. And it's really only until today in the 21st century that we're seeing a kind of breakdown of what art means and who art is for and what art can do and the power of art. And this is where eco art space has come in because our idea and our model and the artists we work with are about working collaboratively and not being these loners in the studio and joining with people from other disciplines and working with scientists and botanists and engineers and architects and biologists, et cetera, et cetera, and realizing that art is part of a team. Artists are team players. They need to get in there and do their thing and use their imagination and their beauty and their wonder and their love and their awe and bring that to everything else that everyone else is doing and then, yes, then art can have the power to advocate for environmental issues and other social issues. So this is really you know, a kind of uh, breakdown of the way that we've thought about art up until now. And you know, in the 20 years of eco art space, um, I've you know, gone from working with museums and galleries to having you know, the question asked, why is this art and how can you call this art? This is science. This is architecture, this is landscape architecture, to today finally, and I hope with this audience you're here for the reason that you're interested, to being open to the idea that art can actually reach out beyond these disciplines. So the very first show that I curated in, on a large scale was at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, and it was a show called Ecovention. And um, sorry, I have to put my glasses on because it's so tiny here, but... Um, uh, the ecovention was a combination of the word ecology and invention, and it was about artists actually doing projects in the real world that had a specific function. So they weren't just addressing an issue, they weren't just about using the imagination or inspiration not to put those things down, but these were artists who really were going to get in there and do things that related to infrastructure. So this is an artist named Meryl Eucles. She's the first New York City artist in residence at the New York City Department of Sanitation. She's been working for 50 years on um, various issues related to recycling and garbage. She's working with landfill. Um, the, the large um, Fresh Kills landfill should be the first artist to do a project there. Um, and this was a piece in Ecovention where she used uh, recycled rubber and glass to, do, uh, to cover a landfill in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this is an artist named Jackie Bruckner. This was a project associated with Ecovention at a place where the Ohio River uh, meets, uh, I think, with the Missouri 
It's, it's a confluence of rivers in Ohio, and it was a stream that led into those rivers that was very polluted. It was next to a ball field, an industrial area where pollution was just coming in through storm, uh, storm water. And she did this beautiful project where she worked, it took 10 years. By the way, I should mention <laughs> that these projects do not happen overnight. They take sometimes five, six, eight, 10, 20 years. Meryl Eucalyptus, Fresh Kills projects would take 50 years to happen. So it takes a very special and certain kind of artist who has the persistence and the dedication and the ability to know it's going to take forever to get these things done. So this piece by Jackie took only eight years. Um, but she did work with local high school students in the community, uh, engaging in community dialogue, community participation to see what the community actually wanted and created this beautiful sculptural piece where these sculptures that start out as hands and meander their way down this pathway and end up as fish are actually water filtration sculptures. They're actually functioning, they're covered in moss and different plants and as this polluted water runs over these sculptures, if they're actually cleaning the water as it passes over them. Um, this is Mel Chin, who Laurie mentioned earlier today, a phenomenal artist. I could talk about him for an hour. Um, but this is his really important um, environmental project that he did um, at the Walker Art Center in a uh, toxic waste site. Uh, they had to wear hazmat suits to go in it. They weren't even allowed to discuss it as they were working on it. Um, because no one was allowed to go there with them. But um, they were testing out, and again, Mel collaborated with a scientist, a USDA scientist, who was working on these plants called hyperaccumulators. And at this point, the scientist had never had an actual test site to do them. He was doing it in a laboratory, testing to see if these particular plants could absorb toxic heavy metals out of the soil. So Mel came along, introduced himself to the scientists, said, I'd like to work with you, and did, they did this project with the Walker Art Center as the main support. And they actually um, planted these um, hyperaccumulators, and they actually did work, and they did absorb heavy metals from the soil. And now this is sort of an amazing case where an artist led the way to now a discovery that's being used. They, this, this process is now an industrial process where they reclaim heavy metals and, and then recycle them again. Um, another amazing artist working in infrastructure, infrastructural project. This is um, a water, uh, water, wastewater recycling plant, Patricia Johansson. Um, this is in Northern California. Um, I included the little drawings on the side to show, yes, these artists do know how to draw and do actually make art. Um, and in Patricia's case, what is so wonderful about her, she starts with these beautiful, very simple drawings of plants and animals, and then she takes them and she has them implemented on this giant scale. So you can sort of, if you turn sideways, see the little field mouse there in the shape in these water filtration ponds. So this is a, you know, an actual functioning site, and it's, you know, it's sewage going into it, and through these various ponds, and as the water moves, it's, it's being uh, cleaned. Um, this is an artist named Stacy Levy, who I worked on a project with Philadelphia at the Schuylkill Center, where she created this sort of test site, again, to see what would happen when deer were not actually allowed. This is a, this is a 250 acre, um, site outside of, it's actually in Philadelphia, but just on the outskirts. And uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful place where they're doing all kinds of um, environmental work, but deer are a very, very serious problem there. And deer, although they're beautiful and we love them and they, we love to see them when they're little babies, they're actually like destroying the under canopy of so many of our forests because we're so out of balance and we have too many deer. So this was a wonderful piece where she, she closed off this area where deer couldn't get in to see actually what would grow there. And you'll have to, get, you'll have to tell me if I'm not talking, so I have to get into my auctioneer voice here. Um, this was another project. I've worked with a lot of artists dealing with agriculture and food, food scarcity issues. This is a permaculture piece by Susan Levovitz Steinman, who used salvage materials to create this beautiful functioning garden. Um, this was an exhibition. Sometimes I actually do things inside. And um, this was a show that was not so much about climate change, but a, more about weather in general and weather as a metaphor. And um, it had a lot of really great artists doing work with photography, sculpture, painting, etc. 
Um, one of the artists in this show is Diane Burko, who's doing incredible paintings dealing with um, diminishing glaciers, going to far-flung places all over the, the world to document and paint and doing a study. She has a whole series called The Politics of Snow, showing before and after paintings of what something looked like, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago and what it looks like today. Diane's here in the audience. You can talk to her later. Um, these were some public projects that I did here in D.C. a few years ago for our, what's called the 5 by 5 project. Um, my piece was called Biodiverse City. Um, this is Tat Fu Tan, who created a labyrinth made of weeds. Um, Tat Fu is an artist from Malaysia. He wanted to make a point about invasives and how sometimes invasives maybe can be a positive thing, culturally speaking. Um, Natalie Jeremijanko, who did a butterfly bridge so that pollinators could cross busy intersections and get from one side to the other. <laughs> she spoke at Fresh Talk last year. Fascinating artist, truly brilliant. Um, this is Brandon Ballinger, who did this piece at the Smithsonian Zoo. Um, he works with um, species, issues having to do with species, in particular frogs and amphibian deformities, in this case insects. Uh, he created this giant dragonfly-shaped sculpture which lit up at night and attracted moths and other insects where theoretically they're supposed to mate. Um, when they mate on the surface, they leave this kind of pheromone. I don't even know if that's the right word, but they leave this kind of trace of their mating process, and so it becomes this kind of uh, insect-created Jackson Pollock-type painting. Um, this is a project that I did in Battery Park City, New York, um, for something called Idea City with a new museum. And it was uh, a project where we were there for 30 days. We used a shipping container. The shipping container became an art studio, a solar paneled, green roofed, vertical gardening, water barrel collection uh, workshop space. Um, and it was incredible. We were there for a month. We had all kinds of kids and moms and Wall Streeters and bankers and recreationers, bicyclers, et cetera, stopping by and doing workshops with us and engaging in all these different kinds of issues that artists were there to make art with them and talk about all these different ways to approach sustainability. Um, this is a recent exhibition I curated called Food Shed Art and Agriculture in Action at a space in Brooklyn called Smack Mellon. Uh, where artists are actually uh, growing food or discussing food issues or working in public spaces in and around this place, which is in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Um, this is the same Tat Fu Tan who did the, um, the invasive weed labyrinth. Um, Tat Fu lives in Staten Island, so when Hurricane Sandy came, he was literally stuck on Staten Island without food and couldn't get off of the island. And, so he decided he was going to take it upon himself to learn how to do uh, dehydration like they do in the army, this MRE type food. So, and he designed this uh, sculpture in the shape of a catamaran. And he actually had his dehydrated MRE food available if anybody was brave enough to try it during the exhibition. Um, this was uh, uh, an empty lot just outside of the gallery. Um, you can see the bridges right there in lower Manhattan. And uh, this was an artist who grew a field of crimson clover in a space that was about to become a high-rise residential building. And they loaned it to us just for a month. And then at the end, we had some friendly goats come eat. Um, this is Jackie Bruckner, the same artist I showed earlier, who did the e-convention uh, in Ohio with the hands and the fish. This is her piece called Prima Lingua, which is actually her original model that she did in 96 to show how the sculpture growing plants and ferns and mosses can actually uh, cleanse water. This is a recent show at Wave Hill, Jackie Bruckner again with another one of her bio sculptures. Um, this is a piece specifically about climate change by an artist named Eve Mosier who did the high water line in lower Manhattan in Brooklyn, marking the 500-year 500, uh, 500 flood line that when Hurricane Sandy came a few, few years later completely proved her point of what the flood line was. She marked it with a blue baseball line chalk. And um, Eco Art Space is doing um, a series of action guides. Eve Mosher was the first one that Patricia Watts worked with her to create. It's completely downloadable on our website, for Eco Art Space blog. And there's Eve out with her 
baseball marker marking the, uh, the flood line. And she did this over a period of six months through Brooklyn and Manhattan. And then she replicated the piece here in Miami and then here in Bristol, UK. And this is a series that uh, we've been working on. Eco Art Space is creating a video archive where we've been working with various pioneer ecological artists to document them and their work. Um, so far, we have 10 video interviews with artists. And um, with Eco Art Space, we've never had a permanent home. We tend to partner just like the artists do. So we partner with environmental groups. We partner with art institutions, galleries, museums, and et cetera, so that we don't have to have our own physical space to maintain, which is very expensive. And there are just two of us running Eco Art Space. So we are um, now in a position where we have accumulated 20 years worth of ephemera and archives. So we are looking for a physical home for our archive. If anyone wants to discuss that with me later, I'd be happy to. Um, but so that's what we've been doing. And I'd be happy to answer any more questions or talk more about any of these artists um, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.